Uh, it was great. I mean, absolutely fantastic to hear from Kelvin Harmon. You remember, that was my guy. And he's become the forgotten man amongst some of us. I'm included. I can't lie. It's easy to forget Kelvin Harmon when you start running off the list of receivers that are going to be competing. And when you start talking about, you know, five or six guys you think are going to make the football team, it's easy to leave out 13. However, when he was drafted two years ago, I sat here and told you I thought he was a second or a third round pick. We got him in the sixth round and I was elated. And we started to see flashes of what Kelvin Harmon could be at the back end of his rookie season. And then unfortunately, you have the torn ACL in the offseason preparing for the 2019 campaign uh, or excuse me, the 2020 campaign. He misses the entire season. And so now essentially he's a red shirt sophomore going into the year and I'm excited for him. The opportunity, he's excited to get back on the field. He says he's even more explosive than he was prior to the injury. And he said he's shocked at his uh, development and how far he's come and just how much faster he feels out on the football field. And he's like, look, it's hard to really quantify how much faster you've gotten when you're just running against yourself. You know, when you're just running out there and it's just you. But getting amongst my peers and, and running around, I feel like I'm right there, if not, you know, a little bit better than where I was prior to the injury. So uh, good for him. I'm rooting for him, man. I'm rooting like hell for him because, again, I thought he had a chance to be a big-time receiver for us when we got him in the draft. And then the flashes I saw towards the end of the 2019 season led me to believe that, you know, he could be at worst – a third option, at best, a damn good number two in this league. I don't think he's a number two right now, but I can't say that for certain. Again, the, the sample size is extremely small, but one thing's for sure, a healthy Kelvin Harmon is a good Kelvin Harmon. And as he said, the thing I bring to the table, because everybody on the team has to find a way to carve out a niche for themselves. What do you bring to the table that allows you to stand out amongst the rest? And he said, look, the thing that I bring to the table is I can go up and get the 50-50 ball. I can make the contested catch. Also, on top of that, I'm digging out safeties, linebackers, whomever you want me to block, corners. I'm putting everybody's dick in the dirt. So I'm your guy. I'm the man for the job. If you're looking for a crack a, 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 a crackdown block, or you're looking for somebody to set a physical block, stalk block somebody outside, I'm the man for the job. And before he got injured, there was no one better on the roster at blocking down the field than Kelvin Harmon, and that's something that does not go unnoticed, okay? Coaches notice a guy when he's able to get a block because the difference between a 15-yard run and a 55-yard run to the crib, a lot of times is whether you're getting assistance outside from one of your teammates, most notably your, your wide receiver. So um, I'm excited about everything that's going on, hearing from these guys and, and listening to them talk about being excited. Cameron Curl talking about how he feels like he can play faster in year two because now he doesn't have to think as much and he knows what he's supposed to do. He's like, I didn't have these OTAs last year. Understand that last year when I showed up, the first time I got with all my teammates was training camp. I didn't. I was a rookie, a seventh round pick. I was wide eyed. I had no idea what was what, and I just had to pick it up. Obviously, they had those uh, Zoom conference calls where they were quizzing the players and trying to get them up to speed. But there's nothing like actually being out on the field, live bullets flying, and and making your mistakes on the field so that you can be corrected. There's nothing like that. There's no replacing actual tangible experience being on the field and getting on the job training there's nothing like it so he's like this is this is great for me you know i'm actually getting to fine tune some things and my head's not spinning this time around so cameron curl sounds like he's locked in cole holcomb is another guy that i'm excited about and holcomb's like man this feels great you know this he said for the first time in what feels like forever, I'm not dealing with a new defense. Remember, Cole Holcomb was drafted in 2019, that same draft class with Kelvin Harmon, right? So he comes in in 2019, and it's a 3-4 defense. 
and his defensive coordinator was uh, Greg Minuski. All right, and so he gets through that shit show. He had never played in a 3-4 defense before, and he comes in, and he learns a new defense, learns a new scheme, and adapts to what they're asking him to do. They get canned in the middle of the season. They switch to a 4-3 the next year, new defensive coordinator, new scheme. He's more comfortable because it's a 4-3, which is what he's accustomed to playing, which is what he did at North Carolina. Still, it's a new scheme. It's new verbiage, new terminology, and new defensive coordinator, and there's no offseason. So second-year player, second consecutive year, new defensive coordinator, second consecutive year, new defensive scheme, and he has to learn everything on the fly, essentially. So it's like he's a rookie all over again, not to mention he gets hurt week one versus the Eagles. So that sets him back a little bit. This year, he's like, man, the, for the first time in my career, I'm in the same defensive scheme for the second year in a row. I've never done that yet. So everybody's comfortable. Everybody's going into year two. If you were here last year, it's the whole gang is back together. Same offensive coordinator, same defensive coordinator, same head coach. There's not all of this, you know, turmoil amongst people in the locker room or there aren't all these stories lingering around. You got to answer questions about Trent Williams or you got to answer questions about Dwayne or this, that, the third. None of that stuff, ancillary stuff in the background, none of that background noise. And there are no changes, okay? There's continuity being built. The excitement <laughs> for just that alone is building for me. You know, when I listen to Cole Holcomb talk about how comfortable he is, more comfortable he is in year two of the same defensive scheme, something he hasn't done before. When I listen to Cam Curl say, man, this is night and day different than what it felt like last year coming in. I'm, I'm getting excited. I mean, the grin is starting to show up on my face, <laughs> okay? And that's why I, I told you guys last week, and I have to tell myself this. I, I remind myself this every time I listen to these guys speak or I listen to a coach speak or I listen to somebody uh, talk about how it, it's our division like today, I was reading a tweet. I want to say it was from either J.P. Finley, it was from John Keim, or it was from Ben Standing, one of the guys that are on the beat for the Washington football team. And they were ha they had uh, a Brian Baldinger on their podcast. I can't remember which one of them it was. But Brian Baldinger, the quote that uh, that particular beat writer took from the interview they had with Brian Baldinger is that, Quote, unquote, it's Washington's division to lose, meaning we're the best team in the division. We won it last year, and the only way we don't win it this year is if we don't win it this year. So uh, when someone says it's your division to lose, it means you're the best team, you're the front runner, you're supposed to take care of business, and if you don't, it's because you didn't do something right. That sounds good. It feels good to have people saying this, and this is what I said last week. You have to take all of that stuff in. And I'm not telling you to run away from that. Embrace it. But also make sure that you don't go all the way to the other end of the spectrum with it. That's, that's where some of you fall victim and pray to all of this praise. Is that you, you believe everything you hear. It blows your head up. And then you start talking crazy. You start talking about, you know, Super Bowl this and... 13 and four that and I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Calm down there. I do think this team has tremendous potential. You know where I stand. I think this team could be. I don't think it will be, but I think this team could be a double digit win team. Again, everything for me hinges upon Ryan Fitzpatrick. That's why I'm so reserved. That's why I refuse to go out on a limb and, and be bullish on this team because I know a lot of you keep trying to convince me. But Louie, look at the numbers. Look at what Fitzpatrick has been doing. Last couple of years of his career, he's playing the best football. I acknowledge all of that. I, I do. But every time I sit back and I look at Ryan Fitzpatrick and I look at his career and I say to myself, it could be fool's gold. You could be setting yourself up for massive disappointment. And he's never been to the postseason. And until that changes, and it could, it could. 
But until that changes, I don't have a lot to go off of. In fact, I have nothing to go off of because he has no playoff experience. That could that could all end though. You know, that could end this year. And that's why people are excited about Washington. If Fitz comes in here with all the talent, obviously we have to stay healthy. Health is of the utmost importance. It is paramount to our success. We stayed relatively healthy last year. We had some nicks and some bruises like everybody else, but for the most part, compared to our past, compared to 2019 and 18 and 17 and 16 and so forth and so forth, where we were banged up and among the most banged up teams every single year. Last year was mild. Last year was fantastic, even. Uh, you know, when you, when you really think about it, you had Landon Collins go down for the season and you had Jaron Christian go down early in the season and Brandon Sheriff go down early in the season, but him he came back. So really, of 22 starters to kick off the season, you had Ioannidis and Landon Collins go down and not return, and then Jaron Christian go down, and we didn't miss a beat when he left the lineup. So, I mean, that was really it. You had Antonio Gibson get injured with the toe late in the season. You had Terry dealing with, uh, I think, a couple of ankle injuries. Uh, but those guys gutted it out for the most part. You know, Cole Holcomb had an injury early in the season. He battled through it. I think he had one late, too. Um, you had Kendall Fuller with the injury early in the season to start the season. But after that, he stayed relatively healthy the entire year. The safety position was the one position that and obviously left tackle at one point when uh, Christian got injured and then Lucas got injured and Morgan Moses had to switch over there. We did have some issues at left tackle, but again, I thought we, we navigated the injury bug pretty well last year. Knock on wood. I'm going to go ahead and knock on that right now in advance. Um, I'm hoping we do that again. If we do that again with the talent that we have and the depth, more importantly, that we now have as well, it's hard not to get excited. Now, let me say this because Marco Polo, I'm just, I just saw one of the comments down in the comment section. And Marco Polo said, Samis Reyes, Samis Reyes is a beast. The more and more I listen to people talk about Samis Reyes, the less and less likely I feel like he's going to make this football team. And that's just, that's keeping it a buck. Like, I told you the expectations for him should be low. I thought he was going to make the football team just because we didn't have anything at tight end. That's the biggest reason why I said he's going to make the team. Who's stopping him? Well, they've went out and acquired tight ends now. You know, when we acquired him, the draft hadn't taken place yet. So there was no, um, there was no John, you know, Bates. You know, there, there, there was no, um, no, what's the guy we just signed from, um, got like eight names <laughs> uh the tight end that we just signed from arizona i think he was in arizona last might have been in cleveland i think it was arizona last you know and then obviously tamarick tamarick hemingway uh, is another guy that we, we should not discount so i looked around and i said who's stopping him from making a roster well they drafted a guy in the fourth round in john bates they added uh, they just added a tight end and They've got Tamarick Hemingway still on this roster. They got a bunch of other guys like uh, Tyrell Swoops. Well, I don't think he's going to make the football team, but Ricky Seals-Jones. Thank you, Awesome4000 and J-Mart. Um, KRC, all of you guys. Booby, all of y'all, thank you for uh, that. Ricky Seals-Jones is the name I was looking for. So they've added more depth, and I think they added Ricky Seals-Jones just to make sure that they've got three solid tight ends on this football team. I don't think Samis Reyes, Samis Reyes is going to be one of them when it's all said and done. I think they feel like they're going to be able to get him onto the practice squad. I cross my fingers that that is the case. A lot of times I'm overly paranoid about other people snatching up our stuff. Um, when you let it hit waivers after the end of training camp last year, it was so easy to get your stuff onto the practice squad because Nobody was able to see your stuff in the preseason. So it was easy to just hide your stuff and say, hey, nobody else knows what's going on over here other than us in practice. So he's safe with us. 
this year there's going to be a preseason. There's going to be tape. I don't know if they're going to have that same rule last year. Remember last year, you could protect like up to three players, I believe it was, each and every single week on your practice squad that couldn't be poached away. I don't know if that's the case when you cut your roster down to 53, however. Like, you don't get to just say, all right, we're going to cut, you know, 10 guys to get us down to 53, but three of these guys, they're going straight to the practice squad. You can't touch them. No, those guys have the ability to sign with other teams first once they clear waivers, and then you put them on the practice squad, then and only then you can start to protect them. That's how I think the rule works. If that rule is back this year, I don't know if that rule will be in effect. That was more for COVID purposes. I didn't hear of them making that a permanent rule change or them experimenting with it an additional year, but that's no here nor there. The bottom line is if he doesn't make the team, he's going to have to clear waivers and he's going to have to want to be back here in Washington. I think he wants to be in Washington. That's where he lives. That's where his family is, you know, his girlfriend, so forth and so forth. This is where he wanted to be. This is where he's getting his coaching right now. I think he's going to be more comfortable staying in Washington and maybe having an opportunity, maybe, you know, down the road this season uh, to get on the roster if something were to happen at the tight end position or being kind of directing his energy towards being ready for the opportunity next year to make the football team. And that's what you usually see with the guy that didn't play. Uh, And this guy hasn't played. And and, uh, Scott Turner said this. He hasn't played any football of any kind. Like, he's still learning the rules of the game, okay? And it's not like he's playing a position like offensive tackle where, you know, there's not as much involved. There's a lot involved in technique and things of that nature, you know, but it's not like he's playing the, you know, running back position or wide receiver or something where, you know, he's he's a tight end. So there's run game things that he's got to get down. There's there's key points and blocking points that he needs in the run game. Then he has to have those same things for the pass game. So there's different keys and different uh, techniques that, that are used to protect in the pass game that he's got to be able to digest. He's got to learn the play calls. And he's a smart guy. If you listen to him talk, you understand he's a very smart guy. But, you know, it's a big learning curve for someone who's never played again. He's still learning the rules. He's still learning the rules. So uh, it's going to take some time. It's going to take some time. We will see what happens. But um, I'm excited. Needless to say. Uh, And uh, listening to the guys, I'm just telling you right now, the swag is on a thousand. Like these dudes are confident, man. They're not cocky. But we talk about athletic arrogance all the time, and you got to have that to be successful. You know, these guys, the swag is on a thousand, man. And I'm going to tell you right now, a guy whose swag has definitely elevated the swag of those around him is Ryan Fitzpatrick. He's always had swag. Doesn't matter where he's been or who he's been around. He always stands out amongst a crowd. So his swag has never been in question. And I can tell that he is definitely elevating the mindset of those around him. I think guys are really buying in. Brandon Sheriff was way too excited about uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick. I mean, you could tell he absolutely loves Fitzpatrick. Listening to Terry talk today, he's already building a rapport and a relationship with um, with Ryan Fitzpatrick, and I, I hear that with other guys. You know, it, it's really something that is starting to catch on that Ryan Fitzpatrick is having an impact. He just got here, and he's already starting to have an impact. Listening to Heineke, listening to Allen, he's having an impact in the quarterback room already. You know, and they're, they're teaching him stuff. Remember, those guys know the playbook more than, than Ryan Fitzpatrick at this point. But, you know, he's a quick study. He's a Harvard, Harvard guy. And he's been in 97 different systems. So he's going to pick it up rather quickly. But there's still some things that these guys know and are more comfortable with than he is. And so it, it's been a mutual, you know, beneficial relationship. So there's a lot of things um that I, I can say definitely definitely got has got me excited to this point but Louis.